So we will, we are going to start this first uh, panel. Uh, this is the most international panel of the, the day. So uh, we will move into English if you don't mind, in order to everybody understand. Uh, we are going to, to start the, this uh, presentation of the case studies, of the country case studies. Uh, we will start with um, the Netherlands. Uh, and I'll ask uh, guys uh, Van Dijk uh, to start uh, this presentation. All right, so thank you very much. I'll, do, uh, I'll take 20 minutes because I'll uh, also introduce the project a, a little bit. Um, so this is a project that has a general objective to assess core performance and of course performance is very broad so I'll explain a little bit how we operationalize that. We focus on duration and effectiveness and effectiveness in terms of the perception of the stakeholders, so the perception of judges, the perception of liquidators, insolvency practitioners, but also bank employees, etc. So that's what we try to do. How did we uh, go about this? So we have four work streams. In the first work stream, we discussed the insolvency laws in the respective countries, and then we looked at core performance by doing a case docket analysis. So we went through approximately 250 and 450 cases to look at the duration of the procedure and kind of get an idea of what could be predictors of, the, of, of this duration. And then in a qualitative study where we had interviews and uh, focus groups, we looked at the difficulties. We tried to identify blockages and best practices from a legal, organizational, professional, and communicational uh, standpoint. And we also looked at the dy dynamics and strategies that could hinder the effectiveness of insolvency law or stimulate the, the, this effect. And then uh, the fourth work stream, uh, that's why we're here, it's the dissemination. So we have conferences, workshops, uh, reports, and, uh, and, and papers. So as I said, we have basically uh, applied a multi-method approach. So we looked at a traditional legal analysis where we focused on the, the insolvency laws in the respective countries. Because what we aim to do is to try to connect the empirical data that we have in the the blockages and the limitations and obstacles and best practices that we find to see if we can link that to the legal systems, right? In order to do that, we first need to know what these legal systems are and what they do. So that's the first part, that's, that's one of the, the methodologies employed. Um, we looked at cases, uh, the case docket analysis between 250 and 450 cases depending on the jurisdiction that was studied. And then, as I said, the qualitative study uh, that consisted of interviews and uh, focus groups. So we conducted approximately 30 interviews per country times four countries, and we did the same for our focus groups. We had three focus groups, in, uh, or we'll have three focus groups in these countries, um, uh, three per country. So what we're going to do is basically provide a summary per country, and we're going to basically follow the, uh, the methodology. So we're first going to present a, a little bit of information on the legal jurisdiction, then we focus on the results of the quantitative analysis and then we proceed to the qualitative study. Um, and I'm going to do that for the Netherlands, so my name is Gijs van Dijk and my colleague Ruben Hollemans uh, will uh, take over uh, almost half of them. Uh, we're from Maastricht University as you can clearly see on the slide. Um, okay, so outline again, legal analysis, case market analysis and the qualitative study. <coughs> so I'm, I'm going to really race through the legal analysis and, and highlight a few uh, important things that we need to know in order to understand the Dutch, uh, Dutch legal system. So once a, a debtor is declared bankrupt, the debtor loses power, that's common in a lot of systems. We appoint an insolvency practitioner, uh, which is appointed by the insolvency uh, judge. The practitioners often are almost always a lawyer. Um, we do not have specialized courts that trial insolvency cases or there's specialized uh, chambers, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about that. As I said, the IP is, is appointed by the court, often an attorney or a lawyer. Um, and then what is really particular for the Dutch legal system is that the, the role of the court, so the formal court and uh, the adjudication, is fairly limited because we appoint supervisory judges and the supervisory judges they supervise the, the bankruptcy, right? So if you need an approval or, or authorization and you go to the supervisory judge as an IP, you ask for, to him or her for, for certain approval. So that's interesting because that supervisory judge has a dual role. It's appointed by a colleague who's sitting across the hallway, basically. 
Uh, and sometimes they change positions, sometimes these supervisory judges act as, uh, as adjudicators and sometimes as, uh, as a supervisory judge. And their main task is to supervise the insolvency practitioner. That, that's what they need to do, that's their formal role. All right, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in qualitative study. So what did we find in the case docket analysis? Well, what did we want to do? We wanted to predict duration, so can we identify certain um, uh, predictors that, that can explain why some insolvency cases last longer or shorter. Uh, we did it for a bunch of cases, uh, 434 in two court districts, the distribution is quite evenly. We looked at a bunch of variables, so we looked at asset size, debt size, number of employees, uh, possible delays. And what we're particularly interested in is because we're looking at core performance, so we're particularly interested in possible delays that have to do with core performance, right? So with the the actions that uh, that these supervisory judges in particular uh, have or are confronted with. All right, so these are some uh, tables to show that, that we have data and it, it kind of looks fancy. I'll race through it if you have questions, uh, you can ask about it later. Um, these are the results, right? So basically what we find is we have these supervisory judges and they're often replaced, often in more than 30% of the, of the cases that we study. And that leads to an 11 to 18 month delay of the insolvency proceeding. We'll come back to, uh, to why that could be in a qualitative study. Um, there's, if there's other delay reported by the IP, um, and these delays can be very, uh, very different by nature, happens in approximately 22% of the cases, you see a 6 to 8% month delay. Uh, and even there's differences between the core districts, right? So in, in core district one, there's the dura average duration is six to eight months shorter than in core district two. And then you can say, yes, but the core district is probably different. They deal with different cases. That's true, but if you look at the variables that we do, we control for all of these variables, which means that we kind of make the cases comparable. So the results seem to suggest that if you adjust for all these influences of these variables, if you keep basically um, if you make these, these courts comparable, then you see a eight, six to eight months uh, difference. And in the qualitative study, I think we found out why that is. Um, if there's a director's liability procedure, it happens very rarely, only 1% of the cases, but if it happens, you see a 24 month delay. If there's no action at all, there's a, the, the case will go five months faster. And if there's an IP replacement, because the IP changes offices, or for whatever reason, you also see a six to 14 months delay. So basically, I guess the take-home message is from this case docket analysis, these supervisory judges they're, they're, could be nice, it could be an interesting uh, avenue to explore, but once you have them and they keep changing, then it's going to cause a lot of delays. All right, and I'll hand over uh, the floor to uh, to. Thank you. Uh, so now the qualitative study. Um, for us, it is important to know the role of the supervisory judge. As uh, Banks already told you, the role of the supervisory judge is extremely important in Dutch bankruptcy law. Uh, so, in the qualitative study, almost all interviewees solely uh, addressed the work of the supervisory judge. Um, in short, again, the role of the supervisory judge, uh, as the name might already suggest, uh, extends to judicial supervision over the IP, uh, the insolvency practitioner. Insolvency judges and supervisory judges have a dual role in the insolvency chamber, as the case already told you. Um, so, uh, what we explored uh, in the interview study uh, are the three main themes, the blockages and the obstacles, the best practices and the strategic behavior. I will now uh, discuss these uh, three themes um, further and I will highlight the most interesting um, findings so far. Okay, the first one, I will start with the blockages and obstacles. Uh, very interesting is the lack of experience <coughs> and uh, expertise within the insolvency chamber. Uh, RPs and other stakeholders frequently brought up the lack of expertise within the insolvency chamber, which is an effect of the so-called rotation system. And the rotation system entails a system in which a judge has only a limited term uh, within the insolvency uh, chamber and has uh, to move on to another <coughs> chamber once his or her term ends. And for example, it could be the criminal chamber or the family chamber or vice versa. Uh, such a term is approximately five or six years. Uh, why is it a blockage? Well, uh, stakeholders perceive it as a, a brain drain. Uh, an inexperienced judge from another chamber, for example, criminal chamber, uh, replaces um, um, 
experienced insolvency judge who has a certain expertise in insolvency law related matters. Um, such replacement will lead to disappearance of important expertise and experience and it, it, it requires several years for the successor to accumulate the um, same levels uh, as his or her predecessor. And this process of accumulation and disappearance of expertise is constantly repeated, um, which has resulted that the insolvency practice in the Netherlands is con uh, constantly confronted with um, um, judges, insolvency judges, whose, lack of ex or whose uh, level of expertise constantly lags behind those of the uh, practitioners. So that's uh, really a blockage because that weakens an efficient continuation of the insolvency procedure. Okay, the next um, blockage is the information asymmetry, which has been brought up by uh, mostly by the uh, judges and supervisory judges. Um, as told, uh, as we told earlier, the supervisory judge has to supervise uh, the insolvency uh, practitioners uh, during the procedure. Uh, this system, in which one actor um, is the executor and performer during the procedures, and what the other actor uh, supervises uh, the other actor, uh, brings along a system in which one actor has access to all information, while the other actor, and in this case that is a supervisory judge, has only uh, the information provided by the insolvency practitioner. Um, but that's a problem because um, the, the supervisory judge is completely dependent on uh, the insolvency practitioner when it comes to information supply. Um, supervisory judges experience uh, situations in which they uh, realize afterwards that um, the uh, IPs uh, deliberately withhold essential information uh, from the supervisory judge. For example, when uh, the supervisory judge had to uh, authorize or to approve certain actions of the IP. Okay. Um, as to all, we are also looking to best practices, and we observed that in certain uh, court uh, district, court uh, district one, uh, for example, that supervisory judges uh, were looking for another uh, way of information. Um, for example, they uh, were uh, inviting, or they uh, invite um, on several occasions the debtors and creditors to their offices at the courthouse sometimes a company of the uh, insolvency practitioner in order to have an additional information stream so that the information is not only coming from the insolvency practitioner but also uh, from the um, doctors and creditors so they have an additional information stream which may um, be very handy if they want uh, to have a full picture of a certain insolvency case. Okay, um, the next um, blockage is about communication with the supervisory judge. Um, we observed two uh, kinds of approaches to uh, communication with the supervisory judge. Uh, at one spectrum uh, we have a direct communication. An example, uh, judges who uh, are open towards communication, direct communication with the supervisory practitioners, um, for example, uh, exchange private cell phone numbers with uh, the insolvency practitioners, uh, meaning that uh, um, issues in a certain case can be handled or settled uh, via cell phone, either by conversation or by sending messages. And we even saw examples in which the supervisory judge uh, communicate through WhatsApp. Okay, um, also face-to-face -face communication is an example of direct communication. Uh, meaning that uh, they also invite the um, uh, insolvency practitioners or other stakeholders to the uh, to their offices to have an open conversation and to settle uh, certain uh, issues in a um, insolvency case. Um, okay, at the other uh, side of the spectrum, we observed uh, indirect communication, uh, meaning that the. Um, um, insolvency practitioners, uh, they do not have any contact with the supervisory judge at all, but only written contact is allowed. And if they want to have a direct conversation with the uh, uh, supervisory judge, they may uh, come away empty-handed. And direct communication uh, between the court and the uh, insolvency practitioners 
only goes via an intermediary at the court, which is in most cases uh, the registry or the uh, clerk. Um, well, the differences between the, those approaches, the direct communication and the indirect communication, uh, are likely to explain the effect of the court district on the duration of the insolvency procedure found in the case docket analysis, a uh, case uh, recently referred to. Um, direct communication, uh, or in court districts where there are uh, is, uh, direct communication, those cases are settled faster uh, than in court districts where there's only indirect communication. Okay. <coughs> yeah, um, we have uh, another uh, blockage, uh, prevalent blockage, and that is the uh, digitization of uh, judicial supervision. Um, the judicial supervision in some cases has made a digital transformation throughout the previous years. Uh, the judiciary developed software that serves as an instrument for communication, for example, to provide information to the supervisory judge or to file a request or approval for certain action. Um, this program is called CAI, which is a um, translated uh, um, abbreviation for uh, quality and innovation of the judiciary. And uh, the um, uh, study, our study, uh, showed that it has several advantages, but also certain limitations. Uh, let's start first with the advantages. Um, um, the communication goes much faster uh, when it's uh, digitized, uh, when the uh, insolvency practitioner wants to uh, file a request uh, for approval or authorization, and then within an hour, the supervisory judge can uh, give permission or authorization. Uh, so that's faster than when it all has to go uh, via um, a written uh, uh, mail. Uh, the limitations. Um, it, it, it increased work intensity for the supervisory judges, but also for the insolvency practitioners, because the software uh, demands a lot of manual actions uh, for the uh, yeah, for, for the persons who are working with the program. And also, um, there are other limitations. For example, the the physical files K replace the physical files, and the physical files uh, um, allow for much more flexibility. For example to um, uh, filter essential information, and CAI doesn't allow that. Okay, um, let's go further with the best practices. Um, well, we, sh we saw, uh, I referred also, I, I already mentioned one uh, best practice, but we also observed these uh, best practices. Uh, the insolvency practitioner has a certain tunnel vision in his uh, or her work in an insolvency case, and supervising judge, because he has a more distant role uh, on a case. He can um, uh, he see uh, certain uh, details that uh, the insolvency practitioner might miss, and that uh, allows him to pull the uh, insolvency practitioner out of his or her tunnel vision. And also de-escalation, which is very interesting for us because it hasn't uh, discussed uh, in literature yet, in Dutch literature, uh, the, the supervisory judges uh, uh, using his or her role to uh, de-escalate uh, confrontations between insolvency practitioner and uh, creditors uh, in order to uh, yeah, de-escalate the situation and uh, uh, you can uh, see it, uh, qualify it as a certain mediation role. It's very interesting and... Uh, okay, uh, let's move on with uh, strategic behavior. We also observe certain uh, uh, strategic behavior, for example, what is called, or what we call, the a customer relation between the insolvency practitioner and the supervisory judge. Um, because the judges assign cases to the uh, insolvency practitioners, their strategic behavior and what information the IP provides to the judge uh, and how <coughs> this is done. Uh, because IPs want to get things done their way, their way and provide the judge with the information that will get them to that point. And uh, I also mentioned uh, that uh, in the context of um, uh, direct communication and, and the information uh, symmetry. Okay, and the last one is overclaiming IPs. Um, the salary of the IP, which is paid from the bankruptcy estate, is not fixed, but is composed of the amount of hours spent on the insolvency case. Uh, the court approves the salary on the basis of the proposal filed by the IP, and it's complicated and to some extent even impossible for the court, for the supervisory judge, to uh, be completely certain that the uh, proposed salary is based on correct and honest time reporting. 
And so this raises the potential risk that the IP um, overclaims in certain uh, cases. Okay, that was um, our uh, the, uh, preliminary results. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much for filling the schedule. And uh, we'll move on to Poland. And uh, we'll have Joanna Kusala Jankowska and Monika Maniska. Hello, my name is Janna Kuczolak Jankowska. I came from Gdańsk University in Poland and uh, uh, I came with Monika Maśnicka, who is uh, the researcher in our team. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Katarina for the invitation to participate in the project. The project is very interesting for me personally, but also for our team. Uh, it's a great uh, experience and uh, I was suggested, I was said during <coughs> our uh, interviews that also uh, Polish practitioners uh, think that uh, the concept of the project when uh, we compare a legal in acts and legal in, uh, and, and law in uh, law in acts and uh, law in action is uh, mm, very interesting. Um, in our presentation, I will uh, present uh, shortly the sources of law in Poland and the main aims of insolvency and restructuring proceedings. And Monika will present uh, the results of uh, uh, court research. Then, uh, in last slides, uh, she will present she will present some conclusions, uh, best practices, practices, and obstacles. Uh, of um, insolvency and restructuring proceedings in Poland. Uh, so, as you may see, um, since uh, 1st January 2016, uh, insolvency proceedings has been regulated in Poland in two autonomous uh, acts, including insolvency law and restructuring law. And uh, these two acts regulate the situation of entrepreneur, uh, uh, especially companies, but also as to the insolvency law <coughs> consumers mm, uh, that are uh, struggling with insolvency, both on, on uh, the early stage, the threat of liquidity loss, the threat of li uh, insolvency, and uh, it is a very advantaged state, uh, uh, I mean bankruptcy. Both facts together provide a comprehensive set of rules of conduct used uh, in cases of insolvency or threat of insolvency of a debtor and introduce substantial reform um, uh, to Polish insolvency law. Uh, after the, uh, this uh, reform of Polish insolvency law, uh, in my opinion, our law is quite modern because uh, it applies a recommendation of uh, um, European Commission of 2014 and uh, uh, World Bank. regulate insolvency as you may see uh, are also commercial companies code uh, here you find the provisions governing the liability of uh, um, members of uh, uh, board of directors of course civil code as well provision concerning the creditors protections uh, protection in the event of debtors insolvency actia pauliana and of course the penal code regulation on crimes involving Rewarding the satisfaction of creditors. Uh, until uh, 1st January 2016, insolvency and restructuring proceedings were included in one act, uh, Insolvency and uh, Rehabilitation Act. Uh, the act provided two types of insolvency, insolvency involving liquidation of estate, and insolvency with the possibility of including arrangement with creditors. Uh, but uh, mm, if the debtor uh, mm, want to uh, conclude the arrangement with creditor, he uh, had to be declared insolvent uh, first. The key changes of uh, new regulation 
um, and what I think is uh, very modern now in Polish uh, legal system is separate, uh, separating restructuring proceedings from insolvency proceedings, introducing four restructuring proceedings. I will show you the proceedings on the next slide. <laughs> introducing of prepackaged liquidation, uh, changing the definition of the uh, debtor insolvency, clarification of insolvency prerequisites, uh, the increased role of council of creditors, changes to claims categories, insolvency proceedings, um, changes uh, to the cost of proceedings catalog and establishing a central re register of restructuring and insolvency, but unfortunately it is still uh, not working, what is one of the most uh, important obstacles of Polish legal system. Um, uh, insolvency and restructuring proceedings in Poland, as I mentioned before, insolvency proceedings uh, uh, mm, mostly involve liquidation. It's, uh, it means the sale of assets. Uh, uh, the main principle is to uh, try to sell uh, the enterprise as a whole as uh, it is possible. Uh, the prepackaged uh, insolvency is also possible. Um, and we've got four uh, mm, uh, arrangement proceedings, uh, um, one out of court proceeding, it's proceedings for the approval of arrangement, accelerated uh, arrangement proceedings, arrangement proceedings and remedial proceedings. Uh, uh, all of these proceedings uh, mm, are uh, um, supervised by a judge commissioner. Uh, the most popular proceedings uh, until uh, um, since 2016 is uh, accelerated uh, arrangement. The main aim of insolvency and restructuring proceedings uh, are of course satisfying of the creditors, but as to the Polish insolvency law, the purpose of restructuring proceedings is to avoid declaration of insolvency through making arrangement with the creditors uh, and in the um, case of remedial proceeding conducting uh, remedial action to continue business activity. Uh, these remedial uh, actions uh, are uh, um, conducted by the uh, administrator. Uh, of course, interest of creditors need to be taken into consideration. And in the contrary, the purpose of insolvency proceedings, uh, the main uh, aim is to satisfy creditors, and if the rational reasons allow to continue business activities uh, of enterprise, uh, it should be uh, sailed uh, as a whole enterprise, as I said. And now, with uh, uh, research results in Poland. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to present uh, the sources of our analysis. Uh, so the conclusions of our research uh, are based uh, both on case um, uh, court cases analysis uh, and some interviews and one focus group. Uh, so we. Um, we analyzed uh, court cases uh, in two courts in Poland. Uh, that was the court in Gdańsk and in Warsaw. Um, the total number of uh, insolvent, insolvency cases was 190. Uh, restructuring cases, it was uh, 53 cases. So uh, totally we um, analyzed uh, almost uh, 250 cases. Uh, we have also had some interviews with um, uh, specialists from the field of uh, insolvency and restructuring law. Uh, so we, we have interviewed some academ academics, uh, clerks, insolvency practitioners, judges, lawyers, um, representative of the bank. Uh, we were lucky also to uh, question the uh, representatives of the Ministry of Economy and representatives um, of the Ministry of Justice. Uh, and we had also a discussion with um, the employee from the social security institution. So uh, we, we have obtained uh, very valuable information uh, and uh, we, I will present the conclusions of uh, those interviews. 
uh, in Gdansk uh, between 2012 and 2016, uh, there were uh, about uh, 1,000 insolvency petitions, uh, and in 353 cases, uh, the court denied to open insolvency proceedings. So the petition was dismissed. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is uh, that um, this, the assets of the uh, debtor was not enough to cover the cost of the proceedings. Uh, so this is quite, uh, as uh, we have uh, discussed this case uh, with other countries, uh, this is quite a unique uh, uh, case in Poland uh, that uh, the court uh, needs to um, d dismiss the insolvency petition when there is uh, not enough assets to cover the cost of the proceedings. So as we can see uh, on these graphics, in uh, about 35% uh, of cases, the court needed to uh, dismiss the insolvency uh, petition and deny to open insolvency proceedings because there were not enough assets uh, to cover the cost of the proceedings. Uh, in almost 30% of cases, uh, that is 290 cases, uh, the insolvency petition was returned due to formal uh, reasons. That is, uh, the petition was incomplete or the fee was not uh, uh, covered. Um, this statistics uh, show, shows us that uh, in almost 60% of cases, uh, the insolvency petition is unsuccessful. And the conclusions of this research uh, is that, uh, first of all, insolvency petitions are filed too late. That is when a uh, debtor um, has no assets that ensure the, uh, the coverage of uh, cost of the proceedings. And the second, uh, the second uh, conclusion is that uh, petitioners, uh, also lawyers, are not familiar with insolvency law. Uh, the truth is that incomplete uh, uh, petitions, insolvency petitions and uh, restructuring petitions as well, uh, are a rule. And uh, this of course causes some uh, specific actions from the court uh, which extends the proceedings. <coughs> as to the duration of the proceedings, uh, according to Polish insolvency law, uh, the court should decide over the insolvency petition within two months after the uh, insolvency petition was filed. We have analyzed this case, uh, this issue in uh, two courts in Gdańsk in Warsaw, and we found out that the average time until the decision regarding insolvency in Gdańsk is four months, and in Warsaw it's two and a half months. So it's uh, definitely uh, exceeded, uh, so the deadline is exceeded. Uh, in case of uh, the time for liquidation, which is counted from the, uh, from the day the court um, declares the insolvency until the, the, there is um, the declaration that insolvency proceedings have been completed. Uh, 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 the Polish law states that um, uh, the trustee should uh, finish the liquidation of assets within six months following declaration of insolvency. And in Gdansk, uh, the average time uh, until the assets were liquidated was 33 months, and in Warsaw it was 10, uh, 20, uh, 23 months. That is, um, that is quite obvious for us that uh, this, um, this deadline, which is included in Polish insolvency law, uh, that is six months, it's uh, very difficult to be, to be kept. Um, uh, the shortest liquidation in Gdańsk was 11 months, the longest almost six years, and in Warsaw it was the, the, the shortest was six months and the long, longest was almost 40 years. So uh, this uh, deadline of six months, which is provided by the law, uh, was kept only in one case in Warsaw. And this case was quite unique because the assets were only money. So uh, I didn't have to sell anything. So uh, the conclusion of this research, of this part of the research, is that uh, Polish law provides for deadlines uh, that can hardly be, be met. Uh, this um, slide uh, regards um, the success, success of the insolvency proceedings uh, because um, if the insolvency proceedings are successful, then there is, after the liquidation of all the assets, then there is the declaration that insolvency proceedings have been completed. And in case uh, that in the course of the proceedings there are no assets left to continue the proceedings, uh, the court needs to discontinue the proceedings. So, uh, as you can see, um, uh, in Gdańsk, 70% uh, of cases were successful, and in Warsaw, the number was 82. So, uh, in those cases, the, there was uh, the successful liquidation of assets. 
and uh, in Gdańsk and in Warsaw, uh, uh, in 16 and 18 cases respectively, uh, the proceedings were discontinued due to the fact that there were no assets to cover the uh, cost of the proceedings. So uh, the, the court uh, first of all opened the proceedings because there were assets, but then uh, he had to, the court had to discontinue the proceedings. And in half of those cases, uh, there, there, uh, the fact was that the fact was that there were some uh, assets, but there was there were no liquid funds, so there was no money, uh, for example, to evaluate uh, the assets to make some announcements. So uh, the fact was that uh, in some cases, uh, insolvency proceedings are of, uh, are discontinued, although there are some assets which could be uh, that, that could cover cost of the proceedings. Um, uh, sale of assets. According to Polish uh, insolvency law, this company should be sold as a whole unless it's not possible. Uh, uh, in Gdansk, only in three cases out of 53, uh, trustee uh, tried to sell a company as a whole, but only in one case he succeeded. And in Warsaw, uh, in 10 out of uh, 100 cases, uh, trustee, trustee tried to sell, sell, to, to sell company as a whole, but uh, in three cases it was a successful sale. Uh, so this proves that uh, uh, the rule, which is included in Polish insolvency law, that is the sale of the company as a whole, which is usually more valuable, uh, is uh, the fact is that it rarely uh, happens. Uh, first of all, there are no no potential buyers for the companies, and the second of all, uh, uh, usually the assets of the companies are. Uh, couldn't be treated as the whole company because it's like, for example, uh, some money, a few, uh, a few chairs, uh, a computer. So it's, it couldn't be treated as a, as the whole uh, company. Uh, as uh, professor, uh, my professor uh, uh, told you, the main, um, the main purpose of insolvency proceedings is the, uh, the maximum F S uh, maximum S S extent of the uh, satisfaction of creditors. So the most important is the interest of creditors in insolvency proceedings. And our research proved that uh, there is a very low level of creditor satisfaction. As we can see, uh, in many cases, in Gdańsk it is 35%, in Warsaw 50% of cases, creditors are satisfied uh, up to 5% <coughs> of, uh, of their credits. <clears throat> the truth is that in 60% of cases, only um, the creditors from the first categories were satisfied and the ordinary, ordinary creditors, uh, like suppliers, uh, weren't satisfied at all. So it means that uh, uh, low uh, in books and uh, low in action, th these are two different uh, things because uh, the truth is that uh, creditors uh, rarely are satisfied with the proceedings. Um, and uh, some conclusions that result from the interviews that we uh, that we organized. Um, insolvency and restructuring petitions often do not meet formal requirements, but it also results from the case analysis. The truth is that um, uh, both uh, uh, professional, uh, uh, professional, um, I mean, the, the lawyers file uh, incomplete uh, petitions as well as entrepreneurs. Uh, the second thing is that judges in Poland are flooded with personal insolvencies. Um, the truth is that a few years ago, um, the law uh, regarding uh, personal uh, insolvencies in Poland was uh, uh, beca became very liberal. Uh, before that, it was very, very difficult to declare, uh, declare uh, the person uh, insolvent. So after the change of law, there was... Uh, big amount of insolvency petitions that we re, uh, regarded uh, uh, natural people uh, and at the same time uh, some smaller um, divisions some smaller courts uh, closed their uh, insolvency divisions so uh, for example in uh, our court in Gdańsk uh, some cases from another uh, court were transferred and it was at the same time as uh, um, so many uh, personal insolvencies were declared declared so uh, each uh, judge uh, is flooded with uh, personal insolvencies and it's very, very difficult for him to concentrate on uh, commercial insolvencies that are uh, more, much more complicated and uh, uh, assets are much more valuable. Uh, 
the truth also is that there is not enough uh, staff in ports. Uh, por uh, ports aren't attractive employer for the administrative administrative staff. Uh, work in ports is connected to stress, low changes, and salaries are not that attractive. So, uh, generally, uh, based ba basing on our conversation with uh, clerks. Uh, generally, people are very reluctant towards uh, working uh, uh, as uh, as clerks in in, uh, in insolvency divisions, and uh, it's very very um, I don't know um, like maybe it's funny, but uh, uh, our IT systems are not adapted to specificities of insolvency and restructuring proceedings. For example, our IT systems, uh, they do not provide for uh, so many parties of the proceedings, like for example, a thousand creditors. So it's like a very, uh, uh, maybe it sounds, uh, I don't know, fun, funny, but uh, we have been told that uh, the clerk needs to, uh, needs like uh, 30 minutes to insert one creditor into the system. So it, it means that uh, the clerk needs the whole day uh, to, uh, inserts uh, specific data, yes, and it really, uh, it's a really big obstacle uh, for the proceedings, yes, from the administrative uh, perspective. Uh, and maybe just, I don't know if I have uh, enough, one. one minute, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to, to uh, speed up. Uh, so the, the uh, mo most important uh, good practice, which is uh, worth uh, mentioning, that we have uh, encountered in our court in Gdańsk, is that um, the, um, the chairman of the uh, insolvency division, uh, who changed uh, recently, decided to organize a meetings with uh, the IPs and judges from the from our uh, jurisdictions <coughs> to discuss uh, the ways to improve uh, insolvency uh, proceedings. They were not, of course, to talking about uh, the rulings where, where, where they are independent, but they, are, they were talking about like some technical stuff. For example, how to put reports, how to uh, mark them, uh, what, what, how do they uh, should be de delivered, what they should uh, contain, which uh, speeds up the work of both uh, uh, courts and uh, is uh, better for the IPs because they do, do not need to uh, uh, fulfill the motions and so on. So we treat it like a good practice, and we know that uh, such meetings uh, aren't very, uh, judges in Warsaw aren't very open for such meetings uh, uh, in the capital city, uh, because they, they are afraid that it, it, it would influence their, their independence, but in Gdańsk it's like, it, it rather refers to uh, technical stuff. So I think that it's a very good practice that, uh, for example, um, uh, in one court to establish one uh, type of reports that should be placed uh, or uh, one type of uh, list of claims, which uh, uh, makes the work for everybody easier. Uh, I think uh, I don't have more time to elaborate. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Joanne and Monica, for your presentation. Uh, also sticking with time which is important for the old day, got it a long day. So we will move to Nicola Labriani from Firenze University. Obrigado, Presidente. Antes de tudo, un, un agradecimiento a Catarina Frade, eh, equipe de investigación portuguesa, por ter concebido este proyecto y por su dirección impecable. <risos> Sem mencionar a hospitalidad impecable también en Coimbra para nuestro primer encuentro y ahora en Lisboa para esta importante conferencia. Thank you, Caterina and friends of Coimbra team for having conceived this project and for your outstanding direction and hospitality. Let's come then to the presentation. For me, it's quite easier because many of the things have already been said by my colleagues. I will therefore try to focus on the most original Italian topics and issues. Uh, the research output is the joint effort of the team of the University of Florence and I wish, I wish to thank here Lucilla Galanti and in a particular way Lorenzo Benedetti for the quality of their work and their tireless dedication to the project. Uh, as our colleagues we present today the main preliminary results of our research. Uh, actually my presentation is starting at the time it should already be over. I, will sum the results up very briefly, focusing on the most important and interesting point of this primary output of our research. Uh, the research is based on the analysis of hundreds of court files and many interviews with a wide range of stakeholders, judges, of course, lawyers, 
and our IPs, many of them are <coughs> accountants, and we are grateful uh, to all of them for having contributed with their valuable experiences to the project. Let's start with the presentation to understand the results. We must briefly recall an overview of Italian insolvency law. Yes, from being to becoming, Pantarei, this is the old Heraclitus, because uh, after 63 years without changing, we have a reform uh, every month, more or less, every year, or the last 13, and now we have an ongoing structural reform. Of course, Luciano Panzani is one of the protagonists. Uh, Italian insolvency law, the reform of 2005 and 6 was dictated by the outdatedness of the bankruptcy law dating back to 1942. Uh, the reform uh, were in line with the pattern of the more developed foreign system, uh, UK and US of course. Uh, the current discipline expressed clear power for the solution of the cri crisis through agreements between creditors and debtors and to avoiding, insofar as possible, liquidation for solution of the crisis that permit the conservation of the going concern of the company rather than leading to its liquidation. The instruments uh, by the current uh, insolvency law for uh, addressing or tackling crisis are bankruptcy, a procedure with the purpose of liquidating the assets of the debtor, including those recovered through the bankruptcy precision in order to proceed to satisfy credits prior to declaration of bankruptcy. Pari passo. Concordato preventivo, this is a, a procedure based on agreements between the company in crisis and its creditor, creditors who vote by majority on the proposal of the debtor and the judicial commissioner and the courts has a role in an uh, important point uh, phase, in particular at the moment of admission to the procedure and that of its approval. Uh, we have a debt restructuring agreement, agreements, and called the ristrutturazione. These are out of court contracts between the debtor and the main or all of its creditor to adopt the measures necessary to overcome the crisis. The court has a role only at the moment of approval. Uh, at the end, the certified recovery plans, piano testati di risanamento, these are fully out of court instruments for solving the crisis situation, to prevent, to identify and prevent. This may be adopted uh, by the company, but normally agreed with a major creditor. There is an agreement. Uh, mm, mm, we have. Uh, we know that uh, the Minister of Justice uh, held is in, in a few weeks uh, should be um, come into effect a new uh, structural reform that not modify but to um, replace completely the actual bankruptcy law dated 1942 which itself has been modified many times over the years. Uh, the request changes uh, part of the present discipline uh, and we have uh, new uh, 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 rules about group insolvency rules, early warning, but the main lines will be confirmed. Let's have a look at the uh, results of our study. Uh, the case studies have been based on the cases supplied by uh, three courts, uh, one of the biggest in Italy, uh, Rome of course, a medium court, uh, medium, big, medium court, Torino, and a small but interesting court is an industrial district, port and Italian industrial district of Prato. Up to now, um, we have completed two focus groups and the main part of the interviews. We have 29 insolvency practitioners have taken part in the empirical research to, of the project. The 29 interviews were uh, 15 insolvency judges, two judge of Supreme Court, one register of insolvency court, four insolvency professors, two accountants, three insolvency lawyers, one member of consultant, one trade unionist. 
The goal is revealing good and bad practices from an empirical perspective, as our colleague said. This is a long uh, list, but a short, it will be a short presentation uh, of the main results. Uh, reported gaps. Uh, group insolvency is one of the gaps in the Italian insolvency law enforced reported by all the operators. Uh, but as we mentioned, uh, the ongoing reform will provide for specific rules for group insolvency. Uh, it's one of the, certainly one of the bright side of the reform. Uh, even if we can already say that some new rules result in a great uncertainty about their meaning. Uh, let's look at the main obstacles. The length of proceeding, yes, the negative opinion about the duration of the proce procedure, not simply for bankruptcy, but also for concordo preventivo, is unanimous among sector operators. Even if at the moment, after a recent amendment, uh, in 2012, is the most important, the situation is better than the one of previous years. There are many reasons for the length of the proceeding. The length of Italian bankruptcy and the agreement solution is due most of all to the bureaucratic complexity of the proceeding. This is the first result and the unanimous opinion of our interviews. Um, second block it is the cost of procedures. The high level of cost is mostly due to the multiplicity of professional roles required by the procedures, but also to uncertainty and predictability about the liquidation criteria of the, ways of the people involved in the proceedings. Um, a crucial point is the role of judges. Uh, the first question is specialization. Uh, interviews have highlighted how up to now judges are not always experienced with insolvency matters. In Italy we have generally speaking specialized insolvency section in almost each court, at least uh, not the smallest, but almost each uh, medium and big court. But judges have no specific professional training in insolvency law during their education. It's an education in progress but we have the same problem of our uh, Dutch colleague about the rotation. We have nine years maximum time for the same uh, insolvency court. Um, about the management of procedures, uh, two bad practices in the modus operandi of the courts are stressed by uh, insolvency practitioners as the following, excessive intervention in the management of the procedures by the judges, the development of practice, practices that um, are significantly different between the various bankruptcy court and uh, the Supreme Court, and uh, even between different sections of the Supreme Court. And this is a problem of predictability uh, that uh, is uh, one of the most important blocks. Um, what about uh, insolvency representative, I mean, curatore fallimentare, is the most important uh, role in the um, broader uh, category of uh, insolvency practitioners. Um, about this point, sector operators unanimously agree on the importance of the technical skills of the insolvency representatives, of the attorneys, and other professional involvement in the proceeding at various level, levels. Although the level of preparation of the professional is considered better than in the past, it is still considered that an adequate level of competence is still to be achieved at the present. Um, there is a technical competence, but it's not a real model culture of restructuring. Not in professional, uh, of course there are, there are bright uh, exceptions, and not even in our business and in our company. This is one of the problems that we go the interviews. Uh, but the appointment control of the insolvency representative, the procedure for appointing the IPs is considered by the operators as basically inefficient. It does not require any form of qualification of the receivers in terms of knowledge of law and managerial capacity. They are in a order, of course. 
in a register of a lawyer or accountants. Normally they are accountants, but uh, there is not a, a specific um, knowledge that is required for. And there are some things, uh, strange things in Italy. For example, the um, Court of Rome appoint only lawyers or accountants that are registered in Rome district. Yeah, <coughs> it's unbelievable, but it's true. <laughs> uh, the question, the important question from a theoretical point of view, is the late emergence of the company crisis. The approach of debt to create crisis and insolvency is more or less unanimously perceived as the real punctum dolens of the system. In terms of bad practices, there is the chronic lateness of the debtor in de identifying the state of crisis and in addressing it. Um, among the bad practices in terms of attitude of creditor, sector operators censure a widespread form of apathy. Uh, this is the creditors, it is a, sometimes a, a rational apathy for the minor creditor uh, that are perceived as inattentive spectators to the bankruptcy or uh, the composition process and with the sole exception of the work and their union sometimes they don't play any role in encouraging the timely emergence of the, the early emergence of the crisis uh, I just conclude uh, with the banks uh, we have a bright side in the first half time and the dark side in the second half time Bank creditors take part in a very active way, uh, much more than non-bank creditor, non-institutional creditors, in the first fa phases of the debt reorganization procedures and at identifying the real asset and financial situation of the company in crisis. During these phases, the banks push for detailed information, effective feasibility of the reorganization measures contemplated in uh, in agreed plans. This is the uh, proactive and the positive function in the first half time. The dark side is that after this first time of activity, banks frequently show little capacity to contribute con constructively to the decisional phase. In this phase, <laughs> banks are virtually absent a fact that burdens the composition procedure with useless delays, with banks frequently reluctant to commit themselves to negotiation. And this is called disorientation for both the debtor and the active creditor. Um, let's conclude with a, a bright side about uh, direct contact among insolvency court and insolvency representative and insolvency practitioner in a uh, broader uh, point of view. Uh, this kind of practice is applied by Prato Court. In a Roma court there is no personal contact with the supervisory judge at all, but it's a very big court and the judges must uh, defend themselves, of course. Uh, insolvency representative is not allowed to have face-to-face uh, -face contact with the supervisory judge. Uh, this is one only allows written contact or via the judicial clerk. Um, such a direct dialogue among the supervisory judge and the insolvency uh, practitioner uh, can result in a decrease of the length of both liquidation and agreement proceeding. Back to the future, this is the, the what you, could you say about the current situation and the new Italian reform? Uh, we can have different point of view. Uh, the glass can be half full or half empty. We have huge differences between courts. Uh, and it makes difficult comparison. Uh, and we must be very careful in presenting our results because it's very different the uh, economic situation of different districts. I just can tell that it's not only a problem of the law in the book, as Joanna says, but uh, uh, of law in action. This is the, the relevance of this project. 
uh, everyone says that creditors are satisfied in a too low percentage, in a too long time. Everyone complains about the lack of the real and modern culture of restructuring. And this is actually a crucial issue. You can make the best reform, but if the practitioners will read the new rules with the old glasses, you cannot reach the goal. Um, and it's a cultural issue, first of all, for our company and our business. And um, in the company run by the family, often the problem is the optimism of the will of the boss that is not balanced by the pessimism of the reason of independent directors, accountants, and other professional standing. Uh, it becomes a problem of corporate governance in the small, also the small company. For example, many uh, companies that not pay security contribution whose controls are more inefficient than tax agency because they do believe they can recover by themselves in a few months. They say, I do, but I can stop when I want, uh, like the drugs addicts. And uh, sometimes their company have the bad end of the drug addicts. And this is one of the most common practices that's postponing cause uh, of a delay in identifying a threat and crisis. And in order to prevent this practice, the ongoing Italian reform introduces an alert system. But um, I don't want to steal any more time, also because Luciano Panzani will be able to speak much better than I could do. Uh, of Italian reform, of which he was one of the protagonists. Once again, thanks to Catalina and our Portuguese friends for hospitality, and thanks all you. Thank you very much for your precision and no delays, not uh, the statement in court. <laughs> but here it's easier, less complex. So we'll move to Catalina Prat to present the Portuguese case. Bom, o facto de julgar em casa, como se diz, eh, permite-me tomar eh, a iniciativa de dispensar de apresentar o regime jurídico português e ir diretamente eh, aos resultados, ou alguns dos nossos primeiros resultados, quanto ao trabalho de campo eh, efetuado. Eh, gostaria de reforçar que o nosso, eh, o nosso espaço temporal de análise se prende com o período compreendido entre janeiro de 2012 e dezembro de 2016, o que significa que, nomeadamente no caso português, corresponde a, aos momentos uh, de uh, maior intensidade do, uh, da crise económica e uh, ao, ao, ao período de maior pressão uh, sobre o sistema judicial português no que respeita à insolvência tanto de empresas como de pessoas simples. Uh, os nossos estudos de caso incidiram sobre uh, os juízes de comércio das comarcas de Lisboa e de Aveiro, uh, uh, na medida em que estamos a falar, e o nosso ponto de partida era uh, a trabalhar com uh, dois tribunais que pudessem ter um volume de casos bastante considerável e uh, que nos permitiria também uh, captar uh, realidades diferentes, múltiplas. Um, e, portanto, enriquecer, no fundo, a percepção que tínhamos, um, ou que queríamos ter, uh, do que se passa uh, na, uh, na vida dos tribunais neste momento. No total que está aqui discriminado, nós uh, analisámos cerca de 412 processos, uh, maioritariamente, uh, como não poderia deixar de ser, de insolvência, 373, e 39 casos de uh, PERS, processos uh, especiais de revitalização. Um, estes processos, uh, ou destes processos, eu vou apresentar apenas brevíssimas, brevíssimos dados para não vos lançar muito com a análise fina, mas, mas temos essa análise uh, feita. Uh, eu acho que uh, importante ressalvar é, no fundo, uh, algo que também já vimos aqui noutras apresentações, que é um, a quantidade, a percentagem de, de processos que não obtêm aquele que é o seu propósito inicial, que é a declaração de insolvência. Portanto, a declaração de insolvência, na nossa amostra, os 50% dos casos de, 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 das petições apresentadas. 
Tomando como base estes 185 processos em que foi decretada a insolvência do, do, do devedor, uh, em 84% desses processos, uh, o processo encerrou por insuficiência de bens, o que é de facto um valor esmagador. Nós tínhamos essa ideia e não tínhamos noção da, da grandeza uh, desse valor. Em 61 destes casos, em 61 destes 185 processos, houve lugar à obtenção de bens, embora, embora como podemos verificar, nem sempre suficientes para manter o processo uh, mais, uh, mais tempo. E o que me parece importante também ressaltar é que apenas em 12% dos processos, ou seja, 22 de 185, houve lugar a ratar. Isto é, houve distribuição uh, aos uh, credores de algum valor obtido com a liquidação. Eu não tenho aqui desagregado, mas efetivamente este valor é substancialmente diferente quando contemplamos o Tribunal, o Juiz de Comércio de Lisboa, onde este valor não chega a 2% dos processos da amostra, comparados com os quase 1% verificados no Tribunal, portanto, no Juiz de Comércio de Aveiro. Uh, o que nos parece, e as informações que fomos recolhendo através das entrevistas, nomeadamente nos próprios tribunais, aos vários operadores, prende-se também com a natureza do tecido socioeconómico destes dois, destas duas regiões, o que faz com que, por exemplo, um, em Aveiro encontremos muitas unidades industriais que têm sempre algum património para, uh, para liquidar, uh, enquanto que em Lisboa temos frequentemente insolvências de empresas de serviços que, de facto, muitas vezes não tem mais do que uma secretária e um computador e, portanto, onde realmente não há muito para, para vender, para poder obter alguma, algum rendimento que possa ser entregue aos credores. E, portanto, também nos pareceu a questão uh, do incidente de qualificação de insolvência. Recordo que uh, alguns destes resultados e algumas das das percepções que vos vou transmitir obtidas a partir das entrevistas e focos do grupo, prendem-se com a realidade que, entretanto, sofreu algumas alterações em 2017. Portanto, será interessante avaliarmos de que modo uh, as recentes alterações legislativas já acomodam ou confortam ou não uh, alguns dos anseios e das dúvidas suscitadas uh, nesta, nesta fase. Uh, e, portanto, o que nós temos aqui é, de facto, uh, na altura, uh, uma abertura uh, de incidente de qualificação de insolvência em quase uh, 70% dos processos, mas destes apenas 4, portanto estou a falar de 4 em 185, uh, foram consideradas insolvências culpóticas. Uh, podemos depois discutir o que é que isso significa, o que é que, que é só 4. Uh, quanto aos, aos PER, o que verificámos é que Quanto à nomeação, na maioria dos processos de, dos processos de recuperação, o administrador judicial provisório foi indicado pelo devedor e acolhida essa sugestão pelo tribunal e mais de metade dos PER analisados findaram com a aprovação de um plano de recuperação. Naturalmente não temos depois o follow-up, que aliás é um dos problemas que é dados em todos os quatro países, é a questão do follow-up da execução ou do cumprimento destes processos. Uh, por exemplo, encontramos alguns, uh, em alguns dos nossos entrevistados, uh, informação de que uh, voltaram a encontrar processos que conheciam de peras, onde participaram de alguma maneira, em alguma, em alguma veste, uh, voltaram a encontrá-los depois, mais tarde, na liquidação. Uh, quanto à duração dos PERS, este é um valor médio, portanto as médias normalmente ocultam alguma, algum, alguns casos que poderiam ser interessantes de trazer, mas não se observam grandes diferenças entre o, o número médio de dias uh, que resulta até à aprovação do plano e, portanto, ao encerramento do processo em Lisboa, na comarca de Lisboa, na comarca de Aveiro. Esse, esse valor já é bastante superior no caso dos processos de insolvência e nós, segundo o que, nos, o que podemos perceber, verificamos que isso tem a ver com o facto, precisamente, de em Aveiro, os processos tenderem a demorar mais tempo, porque chegam a fases mais avançadas, porque há efetiva liquidação em muitos deles, ou uma parte significativa deles. Quanto ao nosso trabalho qualitativo, trabalho de campo de natureza mais qualitativa, nós realizamos um conjunto, portanto, 
quase 30 entrevistas, a um conjunto diversificado de operadores judiciários, diretos e diretos, e também três focus group, e portanto, apraz me registrar que alguns destes participantes, quer nas entrevistas, quer nos focus group, se encontram aqui hoje, e uma saudação muito especial para eles. De forma muito, muito, muito sucinta, até porque temos já alguma, algum atraso nos nossos trabalhos, selecionamos aqueles que nos pareceram três, e são apenas três, dos muitos aspectos que foram elencados pelos nossos entrevistados e participantes, do que são alguns dos problemas que por vezes também têm um lado de boas práticas, e, portanto, aspectos que nos pareceram transversais a todos os discursos que, que, que ouvimos. Um, Refirmo a estes três aspectos que vou desenvolver também muito brevemente, a questão da apresentação a tempo à insolvência ou à recuperação, a questão do administrador de insolvência enquanto agente central, enquanto elemento que está na encruzilhada de todo este processo e, portanto, como dinamizador uh, de todo este processo e depois aquilo que são várias questões uh, agregadas em, uh, sobre este título Uh, inspirado um bocadinho nas questões da accountability e nas questões ambientais, que é a questão da transparência e da traçabilidade, da rastreabilidade uh, dos, dos processos. Um, como vimos aqui em várias intervenções, nomeadamente nesta última, dos do, do nossos parceiros italianos, um, a questão da apresentação atempada à insolvência, que é reconhecida por todos como um dos primeiros obstáculos para o, o sucesso, uh, quer na recuperação atempada das empresas, quer numa liquidação limpa, uma saída do mercado limpa destas mesmas empresas, uh, repousa sem dúvida na, na predominância de um tecido empresarial assente em empresas de pequena e média dimensão, uh, mas não é por serem só de pequena e média dimensão e sobretudo por terem um cariz uh, extremamente familiar que torna uh, a sua gestão Uh, menos profissional do que aquilo que seria talvez expectável, desejável, sobretudo nos tempos atuais. E, e portanto, isso também tem reflexos uh, diretamente na apresentação uh, ou nos pedidos de recuperação, porque uh, faz com que essa apresentação de ter dia uh, faça chegar ao espera empresas que estão verdadeiramente insolventes e não em estado de uh, serem reabilitadas para, para o mercado, para a economia. Naturalmente que isto se reflete depois a, um, a, a vários níveis, nomeadamente a, a falta ou a dificuldade que, que existe da parte destas empresas em ter acesso a, uma, a um apoio técnico ou jurídico especializado que lhes permite efetivamente saber quando agir e como agir. E, portanto, também já aqui foi dito por vários dos intervenientes que a questão das aprendizagens, o saber, o conhecer estes regimes, mas o conhecer uh, numa perspectiva não apenas jurídica, mas, mas também na sua interface com a, a dinâmica económica, uh, é algo que falta significativamente uh, também entre nós. Um, questão dos sistemas de alerta rápido, portanto, trabalhar com estes públicos especiais, Uh, implica que quaisquer sistemas de alerta rápido, e eles começam, e já estão aí alguns, uh, no terreno, uh, e vêm mais com a proposta diretiva, implica que, essa, que os sistemas de alerta rápido, efetivamente, tenham noção da realidade empresarial com a qual se estão a trabalhar, com o público com o qual se dirigem, e uh, isso seria todo um outro tema, também saber, neste caso, na, na detecção precoce das dificuldades, financeiras das empresas, seria importante ver até que ponto o Credor-Estado desempenha as suas tarefas, poderia ter um papel mais ativo ou não, todos os, ou quase todos os intervenientes são unânimos em concordar que o Estado é provavelmente o primeiro que vai a ter noção de que a empresa está a atravessar dificuldades, sobretudo no que diz respeito à falta de pagamento das contribuições para a segurança social e, portanto, será certamente um tema uh, que pode merecer uh, maiores discussões. Quanto à questão do locus control que repousa no nosso sistema jurídico na figura do administrador uh, judicial, uh, a questão é que, de facto, que perpassa por, por todas as entrevistas 
é, é de facto aquilo que poderíamos considerar como uma questão de falta ou de clarificação do perfil identitário desta, desta profissão. Um, foram faladas questões ligadas à formação. Um, não foi, pela maioria dos entrevistados, não foi considerado relevante a questão uh, de ser uma formação mais económica ou mais jurídica, mas já foi destacado como importante o suporte organizacional, as equipas. Foi também destacada a questão do estatuto. Uh, e a questão da fiscalização, e sabemos que hoje em dia uh, está uh, aí na ordem do dia a questão da fiscalização e naturalmente o regime da nomeação que uh, não é unânime, não colhe unanimidade entre os entrevistados, uh, o facto de ser aleatória, mas ter essa habitabilidade de poder não ser uh, sempre efetuada. Uma questão também, para, para resumir, é a questão de saber, afinal, como é que tornamos estes processos mais transparentes. Já foi dito aqui, a Sra. Secretária de Estado destacou aquilo que é, de facto, uma, uma, uma grande mais-valia, que é o tratamento, o processamento eletrónico, a tramitação eletrónica de quase tudo nestes processos, mas isso não parece ser suficiente, de acordo com o que percebemos, um, para garantir que todos os atores processuais e todos os interessados um, efetivamente de, têm acesso à informação de que necessitam sobre o estado do processo. Foi-nos relatado por vários senhores magistrados, por vários uh, senhores oficiais de justiça, uh, a frequência com que, por vezes, grupos de trabalhadores se apresentam nas suas instalações para quererem saber em que está o processo, uh, o facto de uh, alguns dizerem que não recebem informação do tribunal, não recebem informação do administrador judicial uh, e, portanto, uh, esta, esta questão de saber, uh, uh, de ter uma noção exata de onde, uh, em que fase está, onde é que o processo está parado, onde é que está emperrado, é algo que foi também uh, frequentemente destacado. E aqui também a questão do papel da STIC. A STIC tem nos discursos uh, um papel ambivalente. Se, de facto, são um elemento que reforçam a celeridade, a eficiência do trabalho e a transparência da ação dos vários intervenientes, também alguns aspectos relacionados com a STIC, algum desconforto uh, reconduz aquilo que designamos por opacidade, ou seja, a questão dos leilões eletrónicos também não é um elemento consensual, uh, a questão dos sistemas de alerta rápido também gera alguma desconfiança. Um, e, portanto, uh, as tecnologias de informação, sendo os seus auxiliar, um, não garantem todas, uh, todas as condições uh, necessárias para fomentar aquilo que uh, é inteiramente verdade, de acordo com o acho que, que vimos para o caso italiano. É que há aqui todo um processo de cultura, uh, uma mudança cultural que continua ainda por fazer quer ao nível dos empresários, quer ao nível dos operadores judiciários um, que estão menos familiarizados, mas que intervêm nos processos uh, de insolvência e que isso uh, poderá fazer muita diferença na forma como uh, estes processos são tramitados e, sobretudo, pelo sucesso ou insucesso dos seus resultados. Cabe-me agora, e peço só dois minutos ao João Paulo, cabe-me agora fazer uma coisa que foi acordada entre a equipa, que é fazer uma breve súmula dos aspectos comuns ou de, dos principais aspectos comuns uh, que detectámos no nosso trabalho de campo um, e que configuram simultaneamente obstáculos, em alguns casos boas práticas, e, e, agrupados pelos tópicos que, que, que foram identificados inicialmente. Portanto, aspectos legais, a instabilidade uh, do regime legal, portanto, a sucessão de reformas em alguns dos países foi destacada como... Um, como um problema, uma dificuldade um, do sistema, uh, a excessiva complexidade, a existência de várias opções, uh, a excessiva burocracia também, no caso de, dos colegas italianos, como um problema uh, registado, não tão visível em outros casos. No caso português e holandês é sobretudo mais a questão do law enforcement do que propriamente das questões substantivas que uh, dificulta na perspectiva dos interlocutores uh, a sua ação. Uh, a questão da especialização dos tribunais, dos magistrados e dos fun funcionários associada à sua formação 
neste, neste domínio são também elementos que são simultaneamente vistos como uma boa prática ou um obstáculo quando, quando não existem. Uh, a questão da falta de recursos humanos ao nível uh, do pessoal administrativo e a sobrecarga dos tribunais é algo que também é comum a várias jurisdições e mesmo para, para, para terminar, a questão do uh, papel do uh, administrador judicial dos vários sistemas do Insolvency Practitioner é crucial, ele, ele em qualquer um destes, destes processos ele tem um papel uh, único e, e, e de facto é ele que pode uh, estimular uh, o processo ou, uh, e pode, pode efetivamente uh, tornar a, a cooperação entre os vários uh, sujeitos provavelmente mais, uh, mais eficaz, mas a verdade é que muito disto depende muito da ação dos administradores judiciais em qualquer um dos regimes depende muito da interação entre ele e uh, os magistrados judiciais e os juízes, e o papel dos juízes. E esse papel é muito diferente uh, nos vários países analisados, uh, porque, precisamente, a forma como os vários uh, regimes jurídicos permitem a intervenção uh, dos juízes uh, nestes processos acaba por... Uh, dificultar ou facilitar, conforme queiramos ver, a comunicação e o bom desenrolar do processo. Um, no caso italiano, por exemplo, os juízes têm um papel interventivo que vai além daquilo que a lei lhes, uh, lhes atribui, porque tem efetivamente uma intervenção uh, frequente no mérito das propostas que são uh, discutidas. Um, em Portugal, pelo contrário, é-nos relatada a existência de uma certa contenção na intervenção dos magistrados judiciais, porque depende muito da informação que lhes é veiculada pelos administradores judiciais e também pela própria dinâmica do funcionamento das secções. E, no caso holandês, há aqui também tal como no caso português, algumas queixas no sentido da falta de informação. Hum, a questão das novas tecnologias, naturalmente, é vista como uma mais-valia <risos> na medida em que estejam desenvolvidas, como um, um obstáculo quando estamos a falar de sistemas que ainda têm várias limitações, como é o caso do ano. E, sem mais delongas, termino a minha apresentação e agradeço a toda a vossa atenção.